what we know about this Texas football team at each position group halfway through spring practices. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are discussing each position group on this football team. First segment offense, second segment defense, what we know about the Texas Longhorns halfway through spring practices. And in the last segment, the women's basketball team, their magical run ends just short of the final four. They lost in the Elite Eight to NC State on Sunday. We discuss all of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So when, you know, I come on here a lot, I guess, and I've complained about the football offseason, specifically the college football offseason, and just how ridiculously long it is. You know, like this one is a little bit shorter for us because Texas played uh, into the college football playoffs. And then our first game will be on August 31st, which is earlier than usual. So this time it's only, you know, seven months and some change. But, you know, the college football offseason is ridiculously long. And I want to say for no reason, but, you know, obviously when you play a violent game like that, you know, for – uh, 15, 16 weeks in a row, right? You need a long off season to recover and then come back and, you know, do it again. But it's like, man, you know, baseball, it feels like the season ends and then you're right back playing uh, basketball. You know, it's only about three, four months of off season. And it's like football, you go damn near the entire calendar year without any football. And I miss it, man. Like I was just ready to see this 2024 version of the Texas Longhorns. I'm ready to see them play in the SEC and I'm ready to see them compete at the highest level. And hopefully, win a championship in 2024, but, you know, we got to go through the process to get to the results, right? And, you know, right now is uh, spring practices. They're building that championship foundation, and, you know, we'll continue to truck along and get to uh, August 31st as soon as we can. But I said all that to say that the offseason is moving fast, right? It always does, even though it's so long, it moves fast. And we look up and we're already halfway through spring practices, and the orange and white game is in two weeks. It's like, where did the time go? And hopefully I'll wake up one day and it'll be August 31st before we know it. So, we're going through what we know about this Texas Longhorns football team at each position group halfway through spring practices. Once again, the orange and white game in about two and a half weeks on April 20th. So the first thing is, let me make sure it's on April 20th. Is that the date for a Saturday? Well, I'm lying to y'all. Yeah, it is on April 20th. Okay. All right. So starting with the quarterback position, as always, um, and what we know is that Quinn is taking the next step, right? Mentally, um, physically, just leadership, right? He has gotten better, noticeably better, right? Since he played his last game in January, that's pretty much everybody that has been at practices from Steve Sarkeesian to Inside Texas to 24-7 Sports. All the sourcing is that Quinn Ewers is ready to take that next step. They've talked about not only just the intangibles, but the tangibles on the field as well, right? Being more consistent with the deep ball, being more consistent with his accuracy, right? And the short to intermediate areas of the field as well, right? Really being on time with his throws, really putting his throws between the numbers, giving his players an opportunity to run after the catch and make plays. So, um, you know, Quinn Ewers was one of the best quarterbacks in college football last year, but we identified some of the areas that he could take that next step in to be the best quarterback in college football this year and prove to NFL franchises that he is a franchise quarterback. And it sounds like thus far, he's definitely taken that next step to proving to NFL executives that he should be the number one overall pick in the 2025 NFL draft. Getting ahead of ourselves, but that's his goal, and that's what he should be working towards. Also, the Longhorns may still have the best quarterback room in the country. Last year, we talked about Arch Manning as a true freshman, Malik Murphy as a sophomore, and then Quinn Ewers as a redshirt sophomore as potentially the best top three in a quarterback room or on the depth chart in the country. Well, now if Quinn Ewers has taken that next step, they've talked about how Quinn Ewers can't slip up in practice, even though it's not his job to lose because Arch Manning is so good in that number two spot. And we've heard great things, even in a short amount of time about Trey Owens. So I still think, you know, and this is no disrespect to Malik Murphy, right? It's just credit to everybody in the room. I still think the Longhorns have a legitimate argument 
for having the best quarterback room in the country, all the world, you know, all the credit in the world goes to Steve Sarkeesian, AJ Milwee for that, but also the credit goes to Quinn Ewers, Trey Owens and Arch Manning for being really good. Moving on to the running back position. We've heard great things, right? Obviously Cedric Baxter and Jaden Blue are going to be the horses that carry this room, but you know, Savion Red has a defined role in that uh, Wildcat. We'll see how much we utilize that this year. We've heard really good things about Trey Wisner all spring, about how he's making a push to include himself in this rotation and not just be a special teams player. You also brought in two really talented freshman running backs and Jared Gibson and Christian Clark and all, you know, sources and reporting I've seen points to them coming on really strong and not looking like, you know, I want to say rookies, but not looking like true freshmen. Right. Like they really came in um, and performed with like veterans. Right. Thus far during the offseason, I think that's just a testament to Tashar Choice and how well he recruits the position and how well he develops the position. So I think Texas legitimately has six running backs that can play right now. Obviously, all six won't play, you know, and Steve Sarkeesian and Tashar Choice have a tough choice. I guess <laughs> kind of a play on words there on who's going to play. But, you know, we've long called Texas running back you. And right now we have six running backs that I think could get into the game and make plays for this Texas Longhorns football team. That's really good for the now and for the future. Moving on to the tight end position, I think we expected with Jatavian Sanders declaring for the NFL draft, we expected Gunnar Helm to have, you know, a huge offseason and be kind of the de facto tight end one going into next season with his experience in the system. We saw how explosive at times Amari Nyblack was at Alabama. And so when he comes over in the transfer portal, you're saying, oh, OK, he's either your number one tight end or locked into that tight end two role because we know that we run so much 12 personnel and use two tight ends on the field all the time, right? So you're expecting Gunnar Helm to step up into that Jatavian Sanders role and then Amari Nyblack to take that Gunnar Helm role for the past two seasons or vice versa, right? However, you know, the competition ended up shaking out in the off season. What we necessarily didn't expect is that that, I guess, tight end two spot would be somewhat up for grabs. Now, I still think Omari Nyblack ends up with it, but all offseason we've heard really good things about Juan Davis, who was, you know, had one foot in the portal before he was convinced to withdraw and come back to the University of Texas. And Jordan Washington, who's a true freshman, and they say he does not look like a true freshman. So I still think you end up with the majority of your reps going to Gunnar Helm and Omari Nyblack as your tight end one and your tight end two. And Juan Davis, he has been here for a while, so it'll be interesting to see how much he can contribute to this Texas football team right now. But I think the biggest thing for me is because we haven't recruited the position well, you know, like we've recruited and been able to get commitments from tight ends, but they've all been three stars and lower ranked players, right? You expect in an offense like Steve Sarkeesian's, you should be able to go out and get, you know, five stars or top 100 type players at the position. So I'm really encouraged to hear that Jordan Washington has been one of the risers or been one of the, you know, names to watch or look out for this early in the off season, because the future of the tight end position outside of the transfer portal, based on what we recruited was looking a little, you know, it was looking a little light. It was looking a little shallow, but you know, it's good to see that uh, Jordan Washington definitely looks like he could be the future of the tight end position at the 40 acres. In terms of wide receiver, I feel like I've heard just dazzling and, you know, amazing things about every single wide receiver on this team that has participated in offseason workouts thus far. And Silas Bolden hasn't even, you know, been a part of that mix yet. But Isaiah Bond is just dominating. You know, it's funny because I came on here and said that he would have, you know, better numbers than Xavier Worthy put up in terms of season's best at the University of Texas, but also said that we shouldn't, you know, just rush to give him the wide receiver one position because all of these players were hungry and competing for it. And everything I've read says that he's commanding the wide receiver one position, right? He's just dominant in practices, what you love to see, right? You know, he said he made a business decision coming from Alabama to the University of Texas and the main motivation for that was his draft stock. And so obviously he's going to go out there and try to put together a dominant season and be a first round pick. And based on what we're hearing, he's holding up his end of the bargain for sure because he's been dominant in practices. Uh, DeAndre Moore is dominating in the slot. That's interesting to me because, you know, we all thought kind of the top four receivers would be, you know, Golden, Bolden, Bond and Cook. And, uh, you know, DeAndre Moore is really taking advantage of this opportunity with Silas Bolden not being on campus. And so based on what we've heard and how well he's performed and, you know, everybody's saying he's the best route runner on the team. I'm not sure that Steve Sarkeesian can just keep him off the field this year. So really making the wide receiver position interesting. And then Ryan Wingo, right. They've just talked about him 
and he's got, you know, rave reviews, right? As a true freshman, first time in a college program about what he's been able to do, you know, just his intangibles, his mental makeup and what he can actually do on the field with his size and speed combination and his ability to run routes and just catch the ball. So that's another receiver, right? That it's like, he's a true freshman. And right now he would be fifth or sixth on the depth chart, but how do you keep him off the field, right? We've heard really good things about Aaron Butler, right? He's raw, but you know, he may be one of the most talented wide receivers on the team. So this is the deepest this wide receiver room has ever been. And I think we'll see the most production from multiple players out of this room than we've ever seen from Steve Sarkeesian at the 40 acres. And then moving on to the, you know, offensive line, I think what's really encouraging to hear is that Cam Williams is moving a lot better and continues to improve in practices. We know he, we know he has the size and the power to dominate in the run game, but we need to make sure that Quinn Ewers right side is protected. Right. And we know that, you know, Quinn Ewers in the past, I mean, no quarterback is better under pressure, right? But, you know, we, we've seen Quinn Ewers at times can turn into a different quarterback under pressure, right? And so we want to make sure that that right side of the offensive line or, you know, that left side of the, the defensive line is neutralized. And um, Cam Williams seems to be moving a lot better in terms of pass protection. He seems to be locked in at that right tackle spot. So, you know, I think if he can get his feet right, you know, and get his movement skills right, get into a comfortable weight that he's able to dominate at week in and week out, um, he could really be one of the best right tackles in the country. Now, what's interesting is they said Hayden Connor has been getting some work at center. I am not falling for this. They've done this the last two years where somebody has gotten work at center and Jake Majors, you know, job was in jeopardy. No, it's not. <laughs> you can't fool me three times. Jake Majors will be the starting center <laughs> when, when the football season starts. We know that for a fact, regardless of who's getting work at center and who's competing with Jake Majors right now. So you can fool me once not fooling me in 2024, right? So that's the offensive side of the ball. Quick word from our sponsors. And then we get into the defensive updates and then the Texas women's basketball team falling in the Elite Eight shortly after. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Okay, so moving on to the defensive side of the ball, and we're starting with the edge position. And I think it was really important for this Texas staff and this Texas football team to identify the weaknesses on the 2023 football team and then try to make those strengths going into 2024, right? And they've talked about how they're obsessed, right? Obsessed with getting better, obsessed with winning at the highest level, just obsessed with what it takes to be great, right? And so, you know, it's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to be reflective of that. And I think the way that they've attacked improving you know, um, the wide receiver position. Maybe they felt like it was a lack of depth there or, you know, what you lost, you know, coming into the season, the way they've attacked, you know, rebuilding the edge room, right? Because they felt like we didn't necessarily get the pass rush that we should have last year. The way that they attacked, you know, rebuilding the safety room when they feel like our safeties, uh, you know, weren't playing up to standard last year shows an obsession with being better this year, being, you know, shows an obsession um, with being great and shows an obsession with winning at the highest level. So, you know, it's good to have a staff that, can put together this level of talent, develop this level of talent, you know, but also um, represents physically, I guess, or goes out and does, you know, what they say they're going to do, I guess. You know what I mean? Like a staff that, you know, is reflective of what they say, right? Because it's easy to go up there and win the press conference, right? But I think Steve Sarkeesian and his staff not only win the press conferences, right, but they do a good job of actually going out and doing what they say, in those press conferences, right? And they're actually about what they say they're about. And so it's good to have a staff like that at the University of Texas. And that's the reason why we're one of the best programs in the country currently. So 
going back to the edge position, and like I said, they've done a really good job of, you know, improving it and, you know, putting it in a position this year to be a strength, where I feel like last year wasn't necessarily a weakness, but I can't say it was a strength for us. But it's better than it was last season. Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke are taking the next step based on everything that we've heard. Trey Moore and Colin Simmons can flat out rush the passer, and players like Colton Vasick are physically ready to contribute. We've also heard about Justice Finkley taking that next step in terms of – um his physique and how he can better help this Texas football team. So the edge room seems really strong. And like I said, when you add players like Trey Moore and Colin Simmons to it, those are headliners. But on top of the headliners, we have some really good depth in that room and should be able to get an amazing pass rush on opposing quarterbacks this season. Now, in terms of the defensive tackle room, you know, obviously we have big shoes to fill, losing to Andre Sweat and Byron Murphy. Uh, this is over 700, almost 750 pounds of big right there. You know, the staff feels as though we need five to six playable guys at defensive tackle uh, to feel comfortable with the rotation. And we know that Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton are the main guys right now. That's your one, two. That's your Tavondre Sweat and uh, Byron Murphy this year. And so they're going to have to go out and, you know, try to fill those big shoes of, of two All-Americans that are moving on to the National Football League. Tia Savea. Uh, the transfer from Arizona, a defensive tackle. He'll be a huge part of valuable depth in that room. And, you know, hopefully he can come in uh, similar to, you know, like a Trill Carter um, last year or Alfred Collins or Vernon Broughton um, and give you some splash plays when he's in the game. Uh, Alex January, true freshman from Duncanville, not the only, uh, you know, Duncanville defensive lineman making waves. Uh, cause I guess I should say Colin Simmons isn't the only Duncanville defensive lineman making waves uh, in spring practices. Alex January has been mentioned to um, good size and they said he's really coming along. Um, you know, obviously he's a true freshman, you know, for the first time. So I don't know how much they can rely on him. Uh, but definitely, you know, he's he's showing some really good stuff in spring practices thus far. Uh, Jare Bledsoe is is incorporating himself into the position not sure how much of a role he'll have but uh definitely is depth at that position right now um i think what's concerning is we haven't heard a ton about sadir mitchell you know i think sadir mitchell was a highly rated defensive tackle last year as a true freshman somebody i thought that could maybe sneak into the rotation last year as a true freshman but certainly somebody who would be a really valuable player on this football team going into their sophomore year and just to continue to hear that we have question marks about this position to know that we don't have our definitive rotation yet. I feel like we haven't heard enough about Sadir Mitchell, right? Like we should be hearing him at this point is starting to click. He's really starting to dominate in spring practices. This is going to be the year he takes that next step, right? Like we're not hearing any of that. Really the only thing we've heard thus far is the weight concern. So Sadir Mitchell has a ton of talent. I think he can be a dominant force for us inside, but it doesn't feel like it's clicking yet. And hopefully going into his sophomore year in 2024, we could figure something out. Per Inside Texas, one of their sources said that this could be the best linebacker room in the country. I'm not going to pretend to know enough about you know, the rest of the linebacker rooms in the country, but I can tell you the one that the Texas Longhorns has is really, really good. Anthony Hill, you know, obviously one of the best defensive players in the country. We can say that without hesitation, right? David Benda and Mo Blackwell are a hell of a tandem as well. Plus, Leonga LaFau is really showing up in practice, right? Taking that next step heading into his sophomore year. So I really think we have a great group at linebacker. If they're one of the best in the country, that remains to be seen on the field, you know, especially when Anthony Hill and David Bender are taking such a huge step up in their roles from last year um, and replacing such a, you know, a veteran leader and great linebacker in Jalen Ford. But they definitely have the potential just in terms of talent to be the best linebacker group in the country. And that's not even, you know, mentioning players like Darion Gallet, Kendrick Blackshire, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they really could be special at linebacker. At corner, there's a wealth of, a wealth of talent at corner, and Terry Joseph is going to have to make some really tough decisions, right? You know, we talked about how we have like six to seven playable corners, right? You can only put three on the field at a time, right? Unless you're going with some crazy unique defense that I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with. But, you know, you have players like Austin Jordan, Jalen Gilbo, and Jade Barron that can all hold down the star position. And then you got players like Gavin Holmes, Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad, and Jade Barron that can all play the outside corner as well. Not to mention Wardell, Bax, Wardell Mack, Santana Wilson, and Kobe Black are your young corners that I'm sure are hungry to get in and get some playing time as well. So, you know, like I said, you got six to seven playable corners. You got 10 really talented corners in the room, and you got to figure out, you know, how you're going to deploy three of them at a time. Um, I don't envy, you know, Terry Joseph for having to make that decision. I'm just thankful that he has so many talented pieces that it's even a decision he has to make, right? And then when we look at the safety room, the safety room has really improved. We talked about how that was not a strength for us. 
uh, last year. Um, but with the pieces you brought in and just the improvement of the pieces that were here last year, you would expect that that safety room would take a huge jump in terms of production and value this season for the Texas Longhorns. Andrew Makuba can line up anywhere, you know, um, by the line of scrimmage, at linebacker, at any safety spot, and be just as valuable as he was at Clemson for those three years. Jelani McDonald's is making a nice transition um, from that star position uh, to safety, and he looks really good. Expect for him to take that next step and be a valuable part of that rotation this year. The game is slowing down for Derek Williams. Look for him to have a strong sophomore season. Michael Taff, of course, is finding a way to make plays throughout the offseason, and Xavier Filsami and Jordan Johnson Rubel are making a push for playing time, even as true freshmen. So um, I think the safety room is deep. I think the safety room is healthy, and I think now and in the future, we have some of the most talented safeties in the country, and that should transform into a strength, an annual strength for the Texas Longhorns football team, even over the last couple of seasons. It's been one of our – it hasn't been one of our best units. <laughs> All right, quick word from our sponsors. And then we talk about Vic Schaefer and his squad. They had an amazing season, didn't get to where they wanted, but still was one of the best teams in the country from start to finish. All right, today's episode of Locked On Longhorns is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, the 86 percent of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Post your job for free. Locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. The terms and conditions do apply. All right. So um, we're talking about the Texas women's basketball team, and I just want to say that. Uh, I am really thankful for Vic Schaefer. I am thankful for the Texas women's basketball team. I'm thankful for Madison Booker specifically. Um, in the past, when I was growing up, I watched women's basketball, but it was sparingly. But I watched, you know, the great UConn teams, uh, you know, Maya Moore and, and all those players, Candace Parker at Tennessee, um, of course, Brittany Griner at uh, Baylor. Um, and that was my experience, you know, watching women's basketball, mostly watching it in college and like watching it, you know, when the tournament came around. And then I kind of took like a big gap from it, you know, and I just really wasn't watching women's basketball or interested in watching it, to be honest. Right. And when we got Rory Harmon, I watched a few games um, with the Texas women's basketball team and Vic Schaefer, but I still never really just super got into it. And I started watching in the Big 12 tournament this year. Right. I saw a few of the regular season games. Uh, but I was really captivated by Madison Booker, right? And I saw the 35 and I saw the mid-range game and I instantly was just, you know, I'm such a big KD fan. All I could think about was Kevin Durant. I'm like, oh, that looks like KD, <laughs> like, you know, just in women's form, but like, that looks like KD. And then finding out, you know, KD was one of her favorite players and she modeled her game after him. You know, I was just like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that's when I really started to get into the game. And then not to mention just not from the Texas side, but you're watching players at Iowa State like Audie Crooks, right? When I watched her in the Big 12 championship game, she was so fun to watch in the, in the tournament. Uh, obviously, you got Juju at USC. And McKenzie Forbes is really good as well. Um, you know, at UConn, you got Paige Beckers. Obviously, Iowa LSU was last night. Such a great game. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese. Uh, all of those players, you see NC State, you know, that knocked us off with Isaiah James and Sonia Rivers. And then, of course, South Carolina has five stars coming off the bench. So it's just really a good time uh, for women's basketball. You know, I think there's more exposure around the game than ever. There's more eyes on the game than ever. Last night when Iowa and LSU was playing, every group chat I'm in was blowing up. Right. And I've just never remembered the hype around women's basketball um, being this big. But ultimately on top of the hype, right? It's living up to the hype, right? I'm really sitting down watching these games, enjoying the product that's being put on the court right now. And I really think that my introduction into it, of course, I would like tune into the big Caitlin Clark games and like, you know, the championship games, final four, stuff like that. But what really I think got me in terms of consistently watching women's basketball and made me appreciate it on a consistent basis to where I want to watch the regular season. I want to watch conference play. I want to watch the tournaments, you know, the, the conference tournaments and the NCAA tournaments was Vic Schaefer, 
um, the way that this Texas team plays and Madison Booker. You know, I think that's really what hooked me, you know, onto women's basketball. And now I damn near enjoy watching the women more than the men. So, um, you know, I just had to say that spiel that it's been such a great year for women's basketball. I'm excited that it's coming to an end. You know, there's only, uh, you know, I guess what, three more games left, you know, the final four and then the, the championship. But it's been a good year overall. And I think that, you know, it's in a place that's better than it's ever been, especially with future superstars in the game like we have and Madison Booker. Now, on Sunday, Texas was a one seed and, you know, all signs pointed to Texas and South Carolina matching up as two one seeds in the final four. But unfortunately, NC State is just on a magical run, period, in basketball, right? Women's and men's. They both somehow were not expected to get teams in the final four and both somehow got teams in the final four. And, you know, the Texas women came at the expense of that when NC State beat Texas on Sunday, 76 to 66. And, um, I think the biggest reasons that Texas lost is, you know, it's too big of a gap in three point shooting. That's the first reason, you know, in today's game, um, when you're in a tournament like that and you're in a one game setting where you win or go home, um, there's a lot of volatility in the three point shot. Right. And I talked about how Gonzaga was a team that made more threes than Texas even attempted. Right. But Texas was able to defend the three point line really well, defend them overall really well and kind of, you know, make that game a no contest. I thought that game would be way closer than it was. But everything I said that, you know, should be a potential threat for Gonzaga against Texas ended up being the threat for NC State against Texas because Texas does not shoot the three enough or well enough to compete with the best teams in the country that are going to make close to 10 threes a game, right? Like Texas can't go out there and consistently make one or two threes a game and expect teams or expect to beat teams that can light it up from the outside. Like three is just always going to be more than two. And eventually you're going to run into a numbers issue, right? So NC state made more threes than Texas even attempted nine made threes to one 50% shooting compared to 16%. I don't care what seed you are or how much more talent you have than your opponent making eight less threes at 34 less percent than your opponent does, you're probably going to lose that game, especially in a win game scenario on a neutral site. Their best player was the best player on the court, Isaiah James, 27 points, six rebounds and four assists with seven threes made. She was the best player on the court and she's the biggest reason NC State is in the final four. Once again, Texas couldn't convert easy opportunities inside and overall shot 39% from the floor, even though 44 of their 66 points came in the paint, right? So 67% of their points came in the paint, but they still shot only 40% from the field. And really, I rounded up. It was like 39.7. That's not good enough, right? If you're going to be shooting all those shots inside, you better damn near make all of them, right? Especially if you're going to allow another team to shoot 50% from the three-point line while you're only making one of them, right? NC State had 16 fast break points compared to three for Texas, right? So they're getting out on the break and getting those easy opportunities while we saw, you know, Texas, uh, the basketball team, get into the half court and continue to struggle in the half court, either missing shots inside or, you know, uh, Madison Booker as a true freshman trying to carry the load was relatively inefficient as well with her shooting. So um, the loss of Roy Harmon definitely contributed to what we saw on Sunday and just what we've seen at different times in the season. Uh, but Texas needs to adapt especially offensively, and they need to become a team that can get out and run and get easy baskets and also place the floor with outside shooting, right? We see UConn last night, the ability to knock down threes. USC, even though they lost, the ability to knock down threes. South Carolina, they can play through the post, but they can also knock down threes. Obviously, Iowa. <laughs> Right? Like, I don't have to even speak on how Iowa can knock down threes, right? It has hit a historic rate with maybe the best three-point shooter in college basketball all time. And then you got a team like Texas who's trying to finesse the system and just play inside and make one to two three-pointers a game. And like I said, that's just not a winning formula. So um, they need to adapt. They need to become better offensively. They need to become more diverse offensively. And then they need to do a better job of converting those opportunities inside. And once they do that, they can come back next year, hopefully better and stronger, and hopefully make a push to the Final Four and then – to win in a national championship. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I understand it probably got a choppy, probably got a little choppy there at the end, but we at the end. <laughs> Hook them in peace.